Um, our last scene setting set of remarks come from Charlie Leadbeater, um, the renowned innovator, commentator, author, journalist. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Charlie Leadbeater. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, so Charles gave a, a what could be described as a very data-rich presentation based on a database of 2,000 cities. This is going to be a kind of data desert um, based on my fleeting impressions of a series of cities that I visited over the, the course of the last decade. And what I'm going to try and do is explain why these cities were great or not great places to be through the lens of a book about autism. So a man called Simon Baron Cohen wrote a great book about autism um, in which he says that autism is the product of the interaction of two things, systems, the way that people think in systems, and empathy, their ability to connect with other people. And um, I think that all cities um, depend, everyone here, will already today have depended on numerous systems in order to get themselves here, from turning on the electricity to getting some transport to paying for a good to the legal systems that lie behind that, so on and so forth. So our lives as urban people are unimaginable without systems. Um, and so that makes us richer, more efficient. It allows scale. So the, the growth in population that Ben talked about is a huge challenge to systems. But our reliance on systems means that A, we're very dependent upon them, so when they go wrong we go into kind of breakdown and hysteria, um, and secondly that the way that we think of life can often become dominated by systems, so that we see ourselves not being served by these systems but almost being sort of shaped, our lives shaped by them. So the first of these trends or sort of big forces I think in cities which is double-edged is systems and the second is empathy. So cities are daily experiments in empathy. They require huge amounts of distributed capacity for empathy and by empathy I mean our ability to see the point of view of other people, to put ourselves in their shoes, to make a kind of cognitive leap that we understand what they're doing, and some probably effectively that we care about it. So not only do I understand something of your point of view, but I am bothered to be interested in it and maybe even to respond to it. So this capacity for empathy is absolutely at the root of our ability to cooperate, our ability to collaborate, um, our ability to navigate a crowded street, our ability to trade. Um, all depends on this ability to see others and their point of view as something Something that counts. So again, when Ben talked about this rise in population and Charles talked about immigration as a source of strength for cities, that isn't just a challenge about housing and transport and homes, it's a kind of empathy challenge, which is how do these people become part of a city? How do they recognise themselves as citizens and who accepts them as citizens? So cities that are really able to integrate different people have to have enormous reservoirs of empathy. So in the um, cosy world of consulting and advice that I work in, if you take these two ideas, systems and empathy, you can generate a rather pleasing and comforting little two-by-two -two grid, which is kind of where people are, oh, thank God, we've got to a two-by-two -two grid, now we know exactly where we are, we can plot our future, so on and so forth. But what this says, basically, is that if you divide the world into sort of high system experiences, which are repeatable, standardizable, calculated, measurable, and low system experiences, which are bespoke, um, special, one-off, and low empathy experiences, which are highly transactional, no connection whatsoever, um, may be automated, and high empathy experiences where you do get a real sense of connection. Then I think you can think about cities and what makes them work or not through this grid. So the, these are the hardest places to live. Where you do not want to live is in a place where there are no systems and there's no empathy. And too many of the poorest places that Ben talked about in London, which will be no more than a stone's throw from here, often cheap by jowl with the very richest places, are places where there are precious little systems, where the public sector comes and goes in and out, 
sirens blaring, social workers arriving. So there are no really effective systems and there's precious little empathy. There's little trust, people are trapped, so on and so forth. So this is, I, mean, I experience this as low system, low empathy. This is Lagos. Um, I think if you come from Lagos, that might not be how it feels, but it certainly felt like that to me. Um, this is a kind of apocalyptic vision of the future of a city that was once successful. This is Detroit, uh, which now the center of Detroit has been disinvested and is falling to bits. And this is a, a kind of image of a system a systemless city or a, a city that didn't have enough systems and empathy. This is 17th century London, um, where you know very large numbers of children died be before the age of five, where corruption and um, poverty were rampant and disease. And in the Gordon riots, more property was destroyed in London than the entire French Revolution. So um, to get from that to this, then, this is an image of London, I suppose, at its worst, the 2011 riots. And um, whatever you thought of that, some of the places that promoted this and made this happen are places where there are no systems and no empathy. The Pembury estate in Hackney is such a place. And so images of like this, I mean, what's so troubling about this is not just the absence of systems, where were the police, it's the collapse of empathy, our assumption that we can understand the other people in the city that we're living with, and suddenly it appears that they seem very different. And that's why this was so disturbing. It wasn't the police failing, it was this sense that the norms of empathy and reciprocation were breaking down. So if, um, the, I think the biggest challenges, <coughs> social challenges of London, the biggest challenges in many ways are down in this bracket. They are to do with extreme loneliness and isolation. They're to do with growing, people growing up in chaotic, violent and very poor places. If you live down there, then one way to kind of make progress, I suppose, would be to go up here. At least we've got some systems, things that work. And if you do live down in this bottom left-hand corner, then having things that work is an important thing. The trouble with that is that if systems become too dominant on their own, you get kind of rather inhumane and mechanistic visions of the future. This is um, a city called Songdo emerging out of some reclaimed land in Korea. And, you know, it's a sort of everything will have an RFID tag in this city, I suspect. It's kind of perfectly planned. Their idea of culture is a kind of theme park. Um, it's perfectly mechanistically designed um, to do its job. I suppose in London terms, this is a kind of vision of system city, um, planned, emergent, you know, white collar jobs, rather kind of, well, I suppose in Richard Sennett's words, busy but dead, I suppose, that's the danger, that you can get system cities which are busy and efficient but dead and soulless. So there is, I think, a real danger that cities in pursuit of growth can become buy-to-let tagged mall airport cities where everything has an RFID tag, all the property is owned by people in Hong Kong and is let to kind of Londoners, and most of the city's planning is determined by how big a runway it needs and so on and so forth. If you want a vision of a system city, then go to any of those cities in America that have been built around airports, and you will see cities that are there to serve systems rather than systems serving cities. They are designed to serve the system. So there is a real danger in going too far. And because of that danger, then we're quite attracted by down here. And in a way, we spend, I think, quite a lot of our lives sort of in this world, kind of up here, and then we escape at a weekend on our bicycles and we cycle along the canal in Hackney to Borough Broadway Market, and suddenly we're in this world, and it's a kind of huge relief. We're in the kind of low system, highly relational, empathetic city, and there are various kind of visions of that, I suppose, this sort of new urbanism in the United States, white picket fences, um, and there's the high line. The High Line, what an amazing thing. How has such a small space of grass attracted so much yearning and interest? Um, because it's speaking to something very deep that people want, which is a kind of place for sort of conviviality and um, social life in the midst of the city. This place is also highly 
uh, relational and very low system. This is a slum on the edge of Nairobi. Actually, if you wander around here with the right people, it feels like a village. There are no cars, there are no brands, um, there are no police. It's sort of governed without government, really. Um, and so you can have places uh, like this, then, which is a kind of response to the riots and all the rest of it, a sort of sudden resurgence of a sort of relational city in the midst of systems. I mean, there is a danger with all of this, as there is with all sorts of empathy kind of based things, which it can be overly sentimental, very closed, and in a way it's a kind of Richard Curtis vision of the city. If you put, <laughs> if you put Richard Curtis's films, including all the Bridget Jones films, which I count as Richard Curtis films, <laughs> starting with The Failure, which was Camden Boy, and you put them all together, you get what you get is a picture of this kind of city. It's sort of Notting Hill, um, Borough Market, you know, Camden, all together. It's this, this kind of urban family, so on and so forth. Works for some, but not for everyone. So I think you can kind of, and what cities often do is try and find a balance between these. And so this is Tokyo, this is Rapongi Hills, um, built on top of an old development. And this is a vision of modern Tokyo. But actually, most of life in Tokyo is lived on streets like this, which are kind of messy and kind of cluttered, but very vernacular. And again, no cars, lots of pedestrian space. And you could say that the kind of presence of this is system city right next to this, which is non-system city in a way. It's kind of empathetic city. So I think you can do that. But actually, I think the best cities are here. The best cities combine high system. They're very efficient. They're incredibly productive. They use their resources incredibly intelligently. And they're highly empathetic. Um, they have lots of space for conviviality and social life. So my favorite city, Barcelona, I think has this written into its DNA. And that is deeply written in by, by culture and politics. I think it's true of Copenhagen. This is a swimming baths in a, an old docks on the edge of Copenhagen. But Copenhagen has been virtually rebranded by this man, the chief chef at Noma, who has, I mean, 10 years ago, who would have thought that you go to Copenhagen for the best food in the world? But actually, this guy, who's a, a Macedonian Dane, has reinvented it through Noma. Noma is system food with this sort of empathetic edge of foraging and all the rest of it. I think you can do it with iconic buildings if they're cleverly and thoughtfully designed. This is Oslo's Opera House, which is like a public space. And Portland is very good at it. Um, create largely through their promotion of lots of community-based public art. And this place, I think, is very good at it. We're going to talk about uh, New York later. This is Bryant Park. And the people in charge of Bryant Park, rather than putting in beautifully designed architectural benches, have provided people with very easy to use fold away chairs so that when people come at lunchtime to sit in Bryant Park, they can take chairs as they wish and create their own patterns and shapes. So this, I think, is highly efficient and very, very relational because it allows people to reorganize the space as they wish. And then they leave the chairs as this kind of shadow of their kind of interactions and move on. Well, how would we apply it to London? Um, well, first of all, um, the Olympics. The Olympics, it seems to me, were a triumph because of their systematic nature. They built the stuff on time. The most amazing experience, I went to the Olympics one night, and I th it was all amazing, fantastic. And then we got to the railway and kind of coming out, I thought, this is going to be a disaster. We're going to be waiting for an hour here. And sure enough, we were ushered seamlessly onto a train. It was absolutely staggering. It actually worked. So the thing about London Olympics was it was a system success. And we complained about these things, but actually they didn't really inconvenience us very much. And this guy who designed this kind of provided the narrative for it all with Danny Boyle of what we were going through. But actually, in a way, it was these people, of course, who sort of set the tone. And these people were sort of mass empathy. They were designed to be the sort of sensing system of the city. So I think it's possible to create spaces, places, approaches which combine these two things. Final example, this. Um, this is systems gone mad. Um, this is you cannot be trusted. We must control you in multiple confusing ways. Um, and this, 
the shared space initiative in South Ken is system, a systematic way of using empathy and relations to bring about a better outcome, which is better traffic. So this, I think, is where we need to think of the city of the future, to the politics and the design of approaches like this, which are highly systematic, they're very efficient, but they do so by being highly relational and very empathetic and being very open. Not closed, gated empathy, but very open empathy. And that, I think, is the sort of design principle that London should follow in the future. Charlie, brilliant. Thank you very much. Let's just allow.